Thanks for joining us, uh, Frank. Pleasure having you with us. You know, uh, this is a fascinating concept, uh, your book. And uh, as you well know, there's an expression, first mover advantage. I, I guess uh, that doesn't apply. <laughs> it doesn't apply all the time. Sometimes there's a second mover advantage. And sometimes when there's a cat attacking the first mouse, the second mouse gets the cheese. <laughs> so take us through the essential concept here. The basic idea is to look at decision making in different time intervals. Psychologists and behavioral economists and neuroscientists have told us a lot about how we make decisions, what kinds of decisions we should make, why we make decisions. They haven't talked much about when. And so the goal in this book was to explore ideally when we should make decisions. And what I came up with after three years of interviewing a lot of people and looking at cutting edge research was a conclusion that we should wait a lot longer, that we should spend a lot more time given the crush of technology, given email, social media, the 24-hour news cycle, that most of us would be well served taking longer to make better decisions and we'd be happier if we did so. So, so give me an example that everybody would understand. The best example, I think, is apologies. So we're told as children, apologize right away. If you do something wrong, if you hurt someone's feelings, apologize right away. In fact, studies show that apologies are much more effective if they're delayed, delayed as long as possible. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> for example, if you accidentally spill a drink on someone, you should apologize right away. That's an uh, unintentional act. But if you wrong someone at work, if you wrong your spouse, a partner, for example, what you want to do is take as long as possible before you apologize. You should acknowledge what you did at first, but then there are two things that need to happen over the course of the uh, time before the apology. The first one is that the person you've wronged needs a chance to take in information about what you did. They need to understand why you did what you did, what exactly happened, all of the details. And the second thing is they need to vent. It's very valuable for someone to be able to talk through exactly what you did, yell at you, tell you why you were wrong, and then after all of that, after all that's happened, that's when you should apologize. It's a very counterintuitive idea, but the studies suggest, and I think common sense also suggests, that you'd be better off delaying. So, so let's take this into the business realm, even into the investing realm. In the book, you talk about people like you know Warren Buffett or Bill Ackman. It's a very interesting example because we've just had a lot of uh, contact with Bill Ackman because he's taken a big position at uh, Canadian Pacific Railways and uh, um, essentially ousted the CEO and 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 uh, uh, put his own slate on the board there. But but you talk about how. Uh, he doesn't do anything, make any investment, unless it seems like it will be extremely opportune. Are you basically saying just sits around for years waiting for the big one? He is very capable of waiting and being patient. He's working around the clock. He's a very busy guy, and he's looking very carefully at numerous investment opportunities. But he will wait until the price is right. He's very similar to Warren Buffett in this way. He, he, like Warren Buffett, will say you get maybe a dozen or 20 fat pitches, these pitches right down the middle where you're going to have a great opportunity and be able to make a lot of money. That's over the course of a lifetime. And once he figures out what the right bet is, he will hold on to it. He will be a long-term player. And that's true whether he's long or short. He uh, took a large short position in MBIA, and he held on to it for seven years until it finally paid off. So he's somebody who's very good at managing time and knows when to delay. And, and so uh, just back to that Buffett example of the pitch, waiting for the pitch, delaying, waiting and waiting. Is that what you're getting at? Yes, and, and it's similar, people want an analogy, it's very similar to professional athletics. If you watch tennis players at Wimbledon or you watch professional baseball players or cricket, uh, professional athletes are really doing exactly the same thing. They're waiting until the last minute to hit the ball. I, I spent some time uh, with the researchers who have looked at super fast athletes and high speed photography of what they do and the difference between a professional and an amateur is that a professional can wait about an extra 50 milliseconds to be able to swing at the last minute and again the reason to do that to act at the last minute is so that you can take in extra info so that you can kind of sit back even at 
very, very fast speed. So you can sit back and get an advantage over the competitor by taking in extra information and process, having a chance to process that information. So, so, you know, what about the whole move in the markets in recent years to so-called high-frequency trading? Mm. Uh, having the jump on somebody else uh, by milliseconds through some sort of black box algorithm, that doesn't work? Well, it does sometimes, but one of the things I found so interesting about talking to a lot of high-frequency traders was that there are basically two sets of strategies. One of them is to get as fast as you possibly can to get ahead of the market. If you have a piece of information, you want to be the first one in the door. But increasingly, high-frequency traders are trying to do what they call optimizing delay instead of minimizing delay. And they might find that delaying, even at the speed of light, delaying a few milliseconds will give them an advantage. There was one particular firm that I looked at that had set up their computers for high-frequency trading in California, 3,000 miles from the New York Stock Exchange, and they decided, hey, we'll be better if we move our computers to the New York Stock Exchange because we'll be 35 milliseconds faster. <laughs> but they actually found that when they got there, when they moved all their computers east, they were worse. And the way that they got better was by slowing down their computers by 35 milliseconds, that's the amount of time it takes a trade to travel at the speed of light from California to New York. They actually did better by slowing down their computers. And it seems, again, kind of counterintuitive, but if there are a lot of other computers that are getting in first, they might not have the best trading algorithms or they might be fooling you. They might have a mm -hmm. program that was designed to buy a few shares as a kind of feint, like a feint in a fencing duel. Yeah. And if you bite on that too quickly, then you might end up losing money. And so the strategy is kind of like a war game with these computers now. Often the strategies are designed to delay. And, and, and so you, you, you make Jim Cramer in the book uh, from, uh, from our, our competitor CNBC, Mad Money. Uh, you basically say that you're going to lose your money if you, if, if you go with Cramer. Well, it's not my work. It's work done by a bunch of academics who have closely studied the effects sure. of Jim Cramer's recommendations. And I'm, I'm reporting their findings, which are that although uh, Jim Cramer's recommendations have a significant positive effect in the market the next day, stocks on average will go up by about 2% the next day. A lot of us, if we're following his recommendations, are buying stocks at that higher level. And so these studies show that over the longer term, if you hold those recommendations over the longer term, you'll actually end up buying high and then selling low. Of the stocks in the top quintile, according to one study, the uh, stocks recommended by uh, Jim Cramer on Mad Money, they actually declined over a 50-day period as much as 30%. Hmm. So Jim Cramer's a very interesting, informative, uh, entertaining guy. But I'd like to encourage him maybe to take a little bit longer in making his stock recommendations as well. You know, I want to ask you one more question about this before we go to break. And I want to apply your, um, your, your notion to what's been happening in the Eurozone for the last two, three years. The most common phrase is kicking the can down the road. Uh, the policymakers in Europe have been doing that, uh, delaying, delaying uh, some sort of meaningful change in the structure of the Eurozone. Now, that delay, arguably, has not worked. Yes, and one of the key messages of the book, uh, Wade, and the research that I've done is that you've got to figure out what the right time world that you're living in is. What what When should you be making a decision? And I argue that often it's longer, but in the Eurozone, arguably, decisions should have been made much earlier. And in fact, if you look carefully at the assets that uh, Spanish and Greek banks have, uh, these were assets that should have been reflected at much lower prices much earlier, uh, maybe years earlier. So one of the challenges is that there's an art and a science to delay, and you've got to figure out what kind of time world you're living in. Sometimes it's months, sometimes it's years, sometimes it's milliseconds, mm -hmm. but I think in the case of Europe... All right, we are back with Frank Partnoy. He's the author of Wait, the Art and Science of Delay. And um, you, Frank, are a derivatives expert. Uh, you worked at Morgan Stanley. You worked at CS First Boston. And I have to take the opportunity to talk to you a bit about that. Uh, you know, I spoke with Myron Scholes uh, recently uh, when I was in Los Angeles in early May. And I asked him how derivatives regulation would turn out, given Dodd-Frank and other matters. And he said, in a word, badly. Do you agree with him on that? 
Well, I'm not sure exactly what he meant uh, by uh, derivatives regulation. There isn't a lot of derivatives regulation, and even what's done in Dodd-Frank is not really the right kind of regulation to protect average investors from these fiascos we've been having in the derivatives markets. I think that um, w I would agree with him that we're likely to have continuing series of debacles in the derivatives markets, and we've seen that recently over the last few months. But I, I certainly don't think that... Um, that Dodd-Frank was the right solution. It, and I, I probably would agree that it created a lot of additional costs for banks that aren't necessary. But the, one of the most important attempts to regulate derivatives in Dodd-Frank was to try to move them onto centralized exchanges so that they would be traded like stocks. Yeah. And what a lot of people don't realize is that there are gigantic loopholes in Dodd-Frank. And we're, the kinds of dangerous derivatives that are likely to blow up, they aren't going to have the kind of transparency that uh, the U.S. Congress envisioned they might. So when you have a 2,000-page piece of legislation, you have loopholes? Is the, is the fact that it's yeah, that oh, long, yeah. is, that, is that what creates the loopholes rather than just simple rules? I think part of it is the length, and we've moved to being a very rules-based society. We could have some very simple, straightforward standards like we had in the aftermath of the 1929 crash, where we had statutes that were a lot shorter and simpler and common sense. But there are a lot of lobbying interests involved, and the markets are complicated, and so we ended up with this sprawling piece of legislation, and I think um, it's, a, it's the, uh, the wrong admixture of uh, very heavy-handed regulation in some areas and then gigantic holes in the piece of Swiss cheese in other areas. So it's unfortunate that it ended up there, but that's, that's the way the political process often works. You know, what about the recent uh, situation at, at J.P. Morgan? Uh, initially, we heard $2 billion was the loss, but it could be much more, uh, we've, we've heard. Uh, can, can banks properly manage proprietary trading, do you think? I don't think so. I think one of the things that we're learning from all of these banks is that they are not particularly well managed and that buried in the bowels of the banks are traders who are taking on risks that senior managers don't understand and that the traditional metrics for assessing risk aren't working very well. So if you wanted to invest in a bank and you pull out their annual report and read through it, you're going to have a hundred pages of disclosure about risk, details related to derivatives and swaps and proprietary trading, and it's really incomprehensible. And it's incomprehensible to us, and I think the amazing thing is that it's incomprehensible to the senior management as well, that the reports that they're getting aren't really helping them figure out where the bodies are buried within their own institutions, and that's why we keep seeing these blow-ups. But uh, just, to ba uh, just back to your uh, initial part of that answer, uh, you said they're badly managed. Are they badly managed, like the J.P. Morgans of the world, or are they just unmanageable? I think in some respects they're unmanageable. I think the traditional business of banking is manageable. Remember what banks are supposed to be doing, right? They collect deposits, they make loans, they play this important intermediary function in society. That is a manageable function. It always has been. It carries risk, but provides a valuable service to society, to businesses that are trying to raise capital. What's unmanageable is the use of complicated financial instruments, whether it's to speculate or to hedge. People talk about hedging as being a valuable function, but this, this notion of what's called por portfolio hedging, hedging on a portfolio-wide basis, is really almost impossible to manage at a large financial institution. Uh, the, co the combination of, of indices and swaps that are used to hedge are really complicated, and I don't think any large financial institution could really uh, have a good, clear handle on where the risks are would be if they were permitted to engage in that kind of activity. This is a question I've asked a number of people over and over again uh, since all of this happened and, and perhaps even before. How do you adequately distinguish between a hedge and, and running a hedge fund? I don't think you can make that distinction. I mean, I like to say the only perfect hedge is in a Japanese garden. Uh, <laughs> there really isn't a uh, a perfect hedge and once you start down the road of hedging you're going to have mismatches and basis risk. Really what happens is that you run little mini hedge funds inside of banks. 
Um, hedge funds are, are perfectly fine vehicles, and they provide a valuable function as well. Uh, you notice that the hedge funds didn't go under in the financial crisis. In fact, they did quite well. Um, the problem is when you take the function of a hedge fund and you bury it within some massive financial institution where people can get out of control, where they can take bets in the shadows and not be supervised properly and not have skin in the game. I mean, one of the big differences is that hedge funds have skin in the game. They're um, relying on returns to make them money. At, at banks, employees can, can bet shareholders money can bet the public's money and get paid large bonuses and not have to suffer the consequences personally when their bets lose so uh, it's a big difference between inside a bank and at a hedge fund on its own so do you think the the, the so-called too big to fail banks should be broken up and that uh, deposit taking institutions should not be able to trade on their own account I think we'd be a lot better off limiting those kinds of risks within deposit taking institutions I think we'd be a lot better off if these financial institutions were smaller. I think there are some efficiencies of scale, but I think what will happen as technology uh, erodes the profit potential in banking is that the entire banking sector is going to shrink. The traditional banking sector is going to become much more focused on electronics and less personnel. Frankly, that's what's been happening at the banks over the last few years, which is why they're stretching to these complex uh, financial products as ways to generate income, because they haven't been making money in the traditional banking business. And so I think what we've seen some layoffs. We'll see a lot more layoffs, and the banking sector is going to shrink, and I think we'll be better off when it does, and I think we'd all be better off if it were to be streamlined as well so that banks were more like utilities, so that they provided the key function without housing all the risk inside the bank. We're going to take one more break. We'll come back and uh, conclude our conversation with Frank Portnoy. Partnoy, rather, he's the author of Wait. Okay, we are back. A few more minutes left with Frank Partnoy. He is the author of Wait, the Art and Science of Delay. And Frank, I, you know, I want to come back to your, your uh, uh, the essence of your book here. And I, it, it's fascinating. I was, I was speaking with um, the head of McKinsey Consulting a couple of weeks ago, Dominic Barton, and uh, he was talking about the extreme short-termism in the world, uh, in, in the corporate world, uh, the tyranny of quarterly reporting and so forth. And he was arguing for an inclusion in uh, earnings reports and statements by uh, major corporations of long-term goals, not just the, the quarterly results, the results you get every 90 days, but long-term goals as well, so that there's a little less short-termism in uh, corporate life, i.e. a little bit of delay, perhaps, to use your, your notion. What do you think of that? I completely agree. I think that's a great idea. It's part of the strategic uh, process that has led so many companies to consult with McKinsey. It's, it's a hugely important issue in today's fast-paced markets. So many people are managing to the quarter or even to social media where they're trying to satisfy customers' needs on a second-by-second -second basis. And really company to step back and think about where innovation comes from. Innovation and growth come from long-term strategy. And if you look back at the major inventions, even recently, uh, products uh, uh, from Apple and other major technology companies have taken years to develop. They require the kind of commitment uh, that, that companies have historically had that they don't have as much anymore to give employees freedom. And uh, so I, I applaud that. I think uh, it's very important. And if you think about it, really, it goes to uh, what we can accomplish as human beings. As, as technology descends on us, we become more animal-like. And people working at companies have become more animal-like, snap, snap reacting to whatever stimulus is out there that second or that minute. And what the advantage that human beings have over animals is that we can think about the future and think into the, into the long term. And I'd add, it's not just about companies, it's about public policy, too. Our public policy has become very short sided and we could use some of these long-term lessons there as well. Do, do you think things like Twitter and, and email for that matter, they're, they're actually changing our brains? There is a lot of evidence that suggests uh, they're changing our brains and that's problematic. Um, they also are changing our decision making. Uh, without question, our reaction time has speeded up. Uh, there are a number of studies that show this. 
Uh, for example, uh, Sanford DeVoe, a professor at uh, University of Toronto, has shown that if we're exposed to something that has a short-term stimulus, um, like, a, for example, even just a fast food logo, so if we just subliminally have a flash of a, of a fast food logo, we don't realize that we've seen it, we will read 20% faster. Really? So we have physiological changes, but we also just have sociological changes, environmental changes. And we're inundated with not just fast food logos, but Twitter and social. And these are changing and speeding up our reaction time. And what Professor DeVoe has found is that this really is a problem for us, not just for our decision making, but for our happiness as well. We have a hard time. Uh, enjoying uh, aesthetic experiences, we think we become impatient while we're listening to music. Uh, life just generally becomes less enjoyable if we focus more and more on these very short-term stimulus and to the extent we're stimulated and, and have the, this sort of uh, unconscious influence, we're all becoming worse off. Just a little less than a minute left, how do you fight against it personally? Do you turn off, so to speak? shut things off? The, uh, absolutely, and the most important thing I think that I've learned over the last three years of research is to become consciously aware of your own biases. So to know this stuff is speeding you up really helps so you can take a pause, so to consciously take a pause. And to know, for example, that we have all kinds of snap decisions that are biased based on race or gender or all kinds of our preconceived notions, to be aware of that so that we can take a step back and just pause. And just pausing often will eliminate or at least reduce the bias. So that's what I've done uh, as I've learned in studying this uh, in writing weight is that uh, I have some control over it, that I can just by taking a breath, pausing, even for a few seconds, I can reduce or even eliminate uh, some of this crush of technology and its insidious impact on my life, that I have some power to, to be able to help myself in that way. It's been great speaking with you, Frank. Many thanks for joining us. Thank you.